Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us in the virtual Kelly Writers House space here on YouTube this evening. Uh, my name is Jamie Lee Jocelyn, and I am coming to you from South Philadelphia, my home. Uh, and I have the privilege and honor and joy to share with you tonight uh, a reading by the students of our 2021 Summer Workshop for Young Writers. Uh, big applause right now. I know everybody's applauding uh, from your various locations. Uh, we're applauding in our Zoom room here. Uh, we are on day, I think it's technically day 10. Tomorrow will be 11, but we call it a 10 day program. Uh, we have been gathering uh, in Zooms for many hours a day, talking, reading, writing, chatting. Uh, and uh, tonight you're going to get to hear some of the writing that has been produced over these last 10 days. Uh, we have students, high school students, rising 11th and 12th graders coming from all over the country. I made a list earlier. I hope I didn't leave any place out, but we have Massachusetts, Texas, Northern and Southern California, Indiana, New York, Florida, Alabama, South Carolina, Pennsylvania, including right here in Philadelphia, New Jersey, Washington, Delaware, and Virginia. And I'm sure the students will let me know in our Zoom chat if I have left anybody out. Uh, so we're all over the place here um, and it's wonderful and we adore everybody. Uh, we are also very, very, very grateful to the summer workshop staff who have joined us tirelessly uh, subjecting themselves to the occasional overdose of caffeine uh, in these last 10 days. And those people are our beloved David, Amanda, Briar, Nikki, and Isabella. Uh, we're grateful to our craft session instructors who joined us each for um, our afternoon or afternoon evening sessions uh, over these last bunch of days. Some of them are tuning in and we're really grateful for them too. Uh, we're grateful to the Writers House staff who've supported this program in various ways, whether it was uh, finding, finding little goodies around the house to send to the students in their pre-program care packages, um, or Zach Cardner and Nick Seymour, who are here in our Zoom room tonight, or Andrew Beal, who deals with the forms and the business and the things that, that uh, the rest of us don't know about. Uh, and then finally, we're grateful to Maury Povich and Connie Chung, who have made this program possible through their generosity uh, for five years now. This is the fifth, uh, and the fifth time we've done this endeavor together, and we're grateful to Maury and Connie, uh, who are dear to us. Um, they have made it possible for about half of the students here to receive uh, full and half tuition scholarships, which is central to our mission uh, and central to our community. So yes, we are grateful. Um, all right, let's get to it. There's cheers right now in the Zoom chat for financial aid. That's, uh, I second that. Um, all right, we're going to get to it. We are gonna go through our list. You're gonna hear from each reader for about two to three minutes from a piece they've written over the course of, of this 10 day session. All right, our first reader is Ashley B. Hello, this piece is untitled and it's an excerpt. So I'll, I'll start. Um, I have inherited a few things from my mother, one of which is ugly feet. Both of us have wide feet and a propensity to pick at our nails. I have mostly curbed the habit, but years of picking at my toenails until they bled have damaged them, especially my pinky note, toenails, each of which split into a main nail and a tiny yellow side note. I'll spare the more unsavory details. Just know that my mother and I are different people, but we do not have very different feet. My, my nails didn't bother me that much, but I would have preferred if they were at least a little less yellow. I found my solution in Curacao. I applied the clear liquid to my pinky toenails every day dutifully. After a few weeks, I started to notice that my normally yellow and crusted nail was fading to a healthier pink. Now this probably sounds like an advertisement for the product. So to be clear, Curacao is not magic. I just have terrible feet. Um, it did not fix my split toenail issue, only made my toenails turn a little more natural in color. 
so I was marginally but genuinely happier. I told my mother the good news, evangelized her for days, trying to convince her to try the nail treatment. She said she was happy for me, but didn't entertain the notion of trying it herself. Don't you want prettier toenails for JJ's wedding? I asked, frustrated that she didn't want to treat her fungus feet. The answer was always a non-committal grunt and a shoo gesture with her hand. To her, having large toenails was far from the end of the world and wasn't worth wasting time worrying about. Truthfully, I never had a chance to convince her to fix her toes, considering the other health issues she's ignored. When her shoulder first started to hurt, she went to physical therapy for a few sessions before determining that they were too expensive, despite the fact that they did improve her mobility and cost less than most of my extracurriculars. No, no amount of my reasoning could convince her to keep attending the sessions or convince her to keep doing the stretches the physical therapist assigned at home. I don't really care if she uses Curacao or never fixes her toenails, but I want her to take a little more control of her body and its health. I don't want to see her wince in pain when she moves her joints or have her foot fungus progress to the point of painfully dry skin. I don't want to watch her endure and endure with no sight of reprieve. I don't want to accept that no amount of my nagging will change her mind. So I keep a bottle of fungal nail remover by my desk and hope that one day she'll listen to me. Thank you, Ashley. I have the nail remover, it's right here. Oh, I there it is. If you have athlete's foot, I highly recommend it. <laughs> I didn't know we had, we had additional sponsors tonight. So there we go. Um, all right. Moving right along, our next reader is Maya. Hi everyone, I'm Maya, and tonight I'll be reading an excerpt from my story called The Puppeteer. Every girl in my fourth grade class were Patagonia retool snap tee fleece pullovers. I'm not sure when this trend began or who is responsible, but this single article of clothing soon became our unofficial uniform. Every morning we'd don our armor, concealing our developing chests in a layer of fleece. Most of us would pair the pullover with colored jeans and slick our hair back in a headband or tie it up in a ponytail. Those who dared to break the school dress code would wear their pullover atop black leggings. Whether jeans or leggings, headbands or ponytails, we all followed the same outfit formula. My pullover was light blue with purple snaps. As you can imagine, with 20 girls purchasing the same item, color combinations were bound to repeat. But no one had my pullover and I took pride in that. Just like the other girls, I would wake up, eat my breakfast, brush my teeth, put on my pullover and preferred pants, always colored jeans, khakis, or corduroys. I never had the courage to disregard the dress code. Push my hair back in a purple headband, slide on a pair of ballet flats, and hop into the back seat of my mom's car to get to school. After the three minutes and 28 seconds it took from my driveway to the drop-off line, I would arrive on campus where I was greeted by my Patagonia partners. Externally, I looked like the rest of my peers. They'd never know I opened and closed each of the four snaps leading up to the pullover's collar three times before I could leave the house. Just like the pullover trend, I'm not sure exactly when I developed OCD. At the time it was happening, I didn't understand what was going on. No matter how many times my mother said, the voice you're hearing in your head is you, Maya. You can control your thoughts. I never believed I could. My thoughts gripped me so tightly that it felt like I was a marionette doll, vulnerable to the manipulation of my mind. I hadn't realized I was being made to dance. Fourth grade was when students were expected to begin social dance, weekly lessons to teach children how to dance properly. Luckily for me, my swim practice coincided with the dance lessons, freeing me from the embarrassment of this experience. However, dancing still found a way to consume my time. I danced to the tune of my compulsions. One, snap, two, snap, three, snap, four. I twirled and stepped amidst my mental uproar. Five, snap, six, snap, seven, snap, eight. I jumped and skipped, unable to decelerate. Nine, snap 10, snap 11, snap 12. I continued the dance until all may be well. My puppeteer only relented when the dance was key, holding my strings taut until the final beat. I had never liked dancing. My friends always had much more fun doing it than I ever did. But once I started dancing, I felt like I couldn't stop. I danced while eating my breakfast, brushing my teeth, getting dressed, doing my hair, putting on my shoes, and in the backseat of my mom's car. I began dancing everywhere, not just before school. I danced my way through my days and fall asleep with the noise of a lullaby playing in my head. Whenever the music was playing, I had to dance. No matter where I was or who I was with, I couldn't resist the pulling of my strings. I wonder what my mom thought as she watched me wish each room in my house good night before I went to sleep. Most times the music blared so loud in my ears that I could barely hear her say, Maya, it's okay, you don't need to do this, please talk to me. And in my dance, I would always respond, I'm almost done mom, if I don't do this, something bad will happen. Somehow the noise made sense to me and I couldn't deny its pull. I had never felt so drawn to music before. Thank you, Maya. 
Wow. All right. Our next reader is Sydney B. Hi, I'll be reading uh, three pieces that I wrote during the craft sessions. This is inspired by a James Jay's poem entitled Haiku. Upon meeting you at the waffle bar in Savannah, Georgia, upon knowing I had to know more, upon hearing you talk about getting kicked out of Girl Scouts, upon wondering if I should just eat cereal, upon waiting for my wolf to bake for two whole minutes in silence, upon back and forth smiles, eyes locking, upon me asking for your number, upon me giggling in my hotel room and my roommates asking why, how could I tell them? I met a girl at a waffle bar in Savannah, Georgia, and I haven't stopped smiling since. Next. First, the poem, this was a poem until I told you, this is a poem. Then the poem that didn't sound like nothing gold can stay, so I trashed it. But I had to walk all the way to the kitchen to do so because the trash can in my bedroom was full. Now, the poem my sister thinks is too vulnerable. Next, the poem the stars always knew I would write. Then that got back from cleaner, but I'm too disgusted by lint to salvage said poem. Next, the poem that reminds me of changes by David Bowie because I still don't know what I was waiting for. Next, love is not a battlefield. It is a union many will never understand. Love is not bearing arms. It is holding hands. There are no weapons. There should be no weapons because love is peace. It is two journeys that collide, but do not explode. Love is not a bomb. You should not avoid it because you're afraid of getting hurt. Instead, explore it. Love is a vast terrain, mountains, marshes, plains, plateaus, all different, all beautiful, all love. Love is not violent. Blood should not be shed on every encounter. It is not a game. Not feel like you're losing. Love is not a fight, but a compromise. Not a flight, but a stay. Love is not a battlefield. It is a union that many will never understand. Thank you. Thank you, Sydney. As Sydney reads, and as everybody's reading, our Zoom chat is just full of applause and love and repeating the lines that strike us. And uh, it's a whole experience. So I apologize to all of you who aren't, uh, aren't in the Zoom chat with us, but you all have your own chat. So enjoy that chat. All right, next is Shannon. I'll be reading a piece, an, ex an excerpt from the piece that I workshopped. All right, so more than the fact that I didn't want to be convicted of assisted suicide at 13 years old, I was too invested in her well-being to care about mine. So I caved and I did what she wanted. They didn't last a week. She hated me and he did too, rightfully so. However, I didn't understand why she harbored such hate for me over a boy she knew for a week over someone she knew for three years. I didn't understand how I got to that place. I just wanted the person I loved to be happy. Her eye bags grew darker, her skin grew grayer, and her body grew frailer. We didn't talk for a long while. She came up to me one day looking to talk. I felt excited to reconnect. That didn't end up happening. She told me that she wanted to look like me, have my frame, that she was starving and working out to look like me, that I was funnier than her and smarter, and that's why I got the boy. She was going to become my carbon copy because she felt that she wasn't good enough. That broke me. My very existence was the source of my loved one's pain. How dare I exist? I continued to blame myself for a lot of these things as I grew up. I grew cold and bitter, finding myself jealous of a tree. To explain, I wanted to be like the tree, allowed to enjoy the present and be alive in the moment, standing tall and proud, and it would all be without hurting anyone. An eon-long saying that has diluted a lot of the guilt that stems from my undiagnosed savior complex is that you can't save someone who doesn't want to be saved. It sucks. It's a mean quote, but it saved me from myself. I wanted to make someone so happy at one point that I would have gladly lit myself ablaze for their entertainment. For a while, I thought that everything I said in the future, even if it was with the sweetest intentions, would have made someone hate me. I grew wary of my body. Would someone jump off a cliff after seeing me? 
No, they would not, because I am a byproduct of someone who didn't know how to handle a friend well. That is all. I'm not a menace to society because I'm living and breathing. I still struggle to remind myself of this on particularly bad evenings, but I try my best to not let it swallow me whole. Some days when I find myself laughing so hard that it feels like my belly isn't there anymore, there's a flash of a moment where I think of her. I hope she's doing well, and I hope that she experiences leaps and bounds of the amounts of contentment I'm feeling right now. I silently wish and pray for her happiness, that she has found people of her own that give her peace and solace. I do not want anything for her anymore. I only want for myself. It is not the appropriate verb because want instigates get, and I cannot get anything for anyone. Everyone must obtain and find their own individual happiness by themselves. That is the end of the moment, and I don't think of her anymore afterwards. The only things left are the ache in my belly, along with the warmth radiating on the other line where my own people are waiting, not to be saved, but to coexist, grow, and laugh with me. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. All right, our next reader is coming all the way from New Jersey, Cecilia. Thank you, Ms. Jamie Lee. Okay, so this is an excerpt from the safety essay. It is not titled. Um, the sun beat down on the back of my neck, top of my head, exposed arms. It beat down on any exposed skin it could find. The areas that weren't exposed didn't fare much better. My shirt and jeans stuck so closely to my body, I wasn't sure they, could be, they were movable anymore. Most irritatingly, I couldn't see the sun, though it was causing my throat to rasp and cheeks to flush red. It was invisible to me. It lay somewhere beyond the green-crowned trees that encompassed me on all sides. Home was east. Since I was trekking west, all I'd have to do was walk in the opposite direction to go home. That didn't work. I kept walking, spurred by unfamiliarity. I bit back a grin as I poked around the forest. Then I came across the tent, or something like it. It was a small lean-to made of thin logs propped up against a large tree, with an even smaller fence fashioned of chicken wire surrounding it. There was a cot under the lean-to, in some kind of bucket nearby. There was a gray pocket hanging on the fence the size of my forearm. Closer inspection caused me to freeze. The only thing inside this little pocket was a knife. Panic pushed in as heavily around me as the trees did, and I turned to race home. Instantly, my foot got into a disagreement with the sl soft, sloping ground, and my ankle paid the price. Sharp pain raced up my leg before subsiding into a dull ache. Ignoring that, I rocketed off for 20 minutes on my sore ankle, but running off in a random direction did not help me with the being lost problem. In fact, it worsened it considerably. An hour or so later, my dad found me and drove me home. After that ill-fated exertion, I never felt lost again. Several other times, I stopped paying attention to my surroundings and was stranded in who knows where for a few hours, but I never minded. If I'd been lost in the woods at midday for four hours, I could certainly handle wandering the beach for 40 minutes. I could handle getting confused in the maze of a mall. I could even handle getting lost in a foreign country, even though I shouldn't make that a habit. I'm glad I got lost that one time. For one, I know there's a shack with a knife somewhere in the woods near my house. I find this knowledge funny. For a more serious reason, I like knowing that I can get myself out of self-made messes. The self-confidence that comes from being able to get out of scrapes is to me invaluable. After all, if I got myself out of being lost once, I can do it again. The knowledge that I have the ability to literally find myself is a comforting insurance against about when I get lost in the future. Thank you, Cecilia. All right. And next from Southern California, we have Hyla. Hi, everyone. I'm going to read um, two poems that I wrote during the craft sessions. Okay. Consciousness. I close my eyes. I can hear water trickle down the mountain. The singing birds, cuckoo, cuckoo who whisper coordinates to one another, the branches swaying and the buzzing buzz, buzz of the fruitful hive. I close my eyes, sweet sound of silence. I've been thrown into a meditative state, but when I lift the eyelids and stand on legs, all sound is lost. Water, she trickles silently like a stagnant waterfall, birds, they open their mouths, no noise. Branch, he dances without music. Hive, it functions without auditory stimulation. 
I close my eyes and the moss, dirt, ants between my fingers remind me where I am. If I lose texture, I could be anywhere, a cave under the sea, on a mountain, a chamber perhaps. If I lose the eyes too, the body could be anywhere, a vacuum perhaps. She opens her eyes. Next, um, this poem's called Fulfillment. He is beautiful if he possesses fluidity, compassion, thoughtfulness, warmth. Is it in his nature, DNA, embedded in the codons programming his proteins or the result of an environmental catalyst? An explosion means that creation takes center stage. An explosion placed a loving soul within a vessel. The vessel inside a heart-shaped box in the garden and other fragments under the sea incorporated within the seaweed and sea salt. Ah, oh, thank you, Hyla. Thank you so much. Next is Nusra. Hi, so I'm going to be reading the essay I wrote for the direct address and I titled it, To My Eating Disorder, Fuck You. You made me feel cold. You made me feel dizzy. You made my memories blurry. You made waking up a disaster. You made me lie throughout all of elementary school. I was 38 pounds at age eight, but my mouth would spit out that I was 70. I always wore baggy clothes throughout the entire school year. While kids wearing tank top and shorts in the summer, I was wearing big long sleeves paired with huge pants. Sometimes my peers would ask me why, and I would say, my mom said I can't wear short clothes. Just so you know, my fingers were crossed behind my back. You made my mother cry. I had never seen her vulnerable side until she broke down because I would not eat, because of my fear of eating. She was distressed and she had every right to be. Imagine raising a child who wouldn't eat the food that you put your blood, sweat, and tears into making. Well, you would never understand because all you ever do is torture all sorts of people. Are you proud of yourself? Are you proud of running the, ruining the millions of lives of individuals? Are you proud of making weight a touchy topic? Are you proud of being the product of unsettling beauty standards? It seems like you're, we're having fun. Care to explain how it's so exciting to make, manipulate one's mind and body. Breaking off our troublesome relationship was the best thing I had ever done. Doctors and families had my back even when my emotions were swerving north, south, east, and west. The, the entire process was frustrating, but I managed to push you away with full force. Without your presence, I have less unnecessary things to worry about. My dopamine levels were stable, and I can finally be seen as healthy in my gym teacher's eyes. Without you, I feel happy, a feeling that you should never experience. It's too good for an imbecile like you. Thank you, Nusrat. All right, next is Jyothi. This is an excerpt from my direct address piece. To the dad who never stopped being my rock. I don't remember much from my childhood, partly because it was so long ago, but also because it's too traumatic to dig back into a world where you were whole. You used to work a lot. I remember that. But every night when you came home, you were mine. I miss those nights when I would sit staring at the ceiling, imagining the stars kissing the sky above, leaving shiny glimmers of themselves everywhere they go. I would ask you a million and one questions on those nights, and you would sit patiently on my bed, squeezing my hand and thinking about how to describe the way the night sky fades into the light. I would ask about the rivers that ran through our city and the waves a tiny stone could create. You had all the answers back then, I remember the first time you fell, quick and hard on your back. I came running and found you crumpled on the floor. You looked up to me, eyes glazed with fear. We all thought it was a backache, some weird consequence of running too much. I knew that was a lie, but I wanted to believe you. So when Dadi came over, startled to find you on the floor, backache, I told her, and she believed me too. I forget how difficult it must be for you, having your mom living in the same house as you, watching you slowly deteriorate into a shadow, a mere silhouette of the man you were before. 
Did you know then that a backache was a bunch of BS and the real enemy was out of your control? Did you know that your body would betray you? But I never ask you these questions because deep down, I knew you knew something was wrong. Although I can no longer deny it when we took a trip to the hospital after another fall and the doctor asked if you had any conditions. You stared at me for a moment, then murmured, ALS. Did you know that my world shattered in that moment? That when I asked where the bathroom was, it was because I couldn't hold in my tears? Did you know that I would look up what ALS was and fearfully learn about your deteriorating and deadly fate? I don't remember much of what happened after. The memory only comes back in fuzzy pieces to a puzzle I don't know how to solve, but I do know that memory, that moment changed my life. And now my body has forgotten what it feels like to be held in a father's arms. And my ears have forgotten what it sounds like to hear your love. And it scares me when I think about how much has changed. Your body now shivers under the influence of your muscles as if a water ripple was traveling down your body. Thank you. Thank you, Jyoti. Next is Tina. Okay, so I will be reading an excerpt of a letter to my aunt. Everyone, especially my mom, used to call me crazy girl in Fujonese. I never figured out who started the nickname, but I always assumed it was you. When people talked about you, they called you something that sounded like it had the word for crazy in it too. What they said could have been your actual name, but I never asked, mostly because I believed I was right. All of this is speculation, but all speculation is based on evidence. They called me crazy because I would scratch Waipole whenever she held me in her arms. I saw this in a videotape years ago and regret clawed at the part of my heart where homesickness was. My parents got used to only taking care of my little brother while I was gone. So when I returned three years later, I startled them. They weren't accustomed to a four-year-old running around barefoot or painting the white walls with snot or taking off all their clothes in her sleep because the heavy blankets in America made everything too hot. They called you crazy because you carried a rebellious streak into adulthood. They said you had a short temper and were, and were born with too much fire at birth, but that also could have been why they left all the kids for you to look after. You often spanked me with those thin bamboo sticks according to Nai Nai, who said she heard it from me first. While everyone ended up moving across the ocean, you stayed back in Fujin, and in my mind as perpetually young, a growing cactus in a forest of aged willows. I don't blame you for my nickname. I want to think of you as a good person. But although you were a force early on in my life, childhood memories are like fish cakes in a hot pot. You scoop them up for a heartbeat before they fall back into the broth with the splash that burns your wrist. I still haven't cried over your death, even though I thought I would. I use college essays and schoolwork as an excuse to avoid thinking about you because I try to call myself a compartmental mourner because I want to be strong and unfazed like the confident woman leads on TV. Take Shen Lu's scene in The Rational Life. I think you would have liked her, not because you would have seen yourself in her. Like me, you would have wanted to be her. Luo Xin's an unmarried associate lawyer in her 30s. In one scene, she gets splashed with freezing soda in a confrontation with an unhappy client. Right after the incident, she rushes to the bathroom, cries for the first time in 10 episodes, and returns to her desk snot-free. You probably never watched The Rational Life because it was released late in your cancer, and I only watched the English subtitle version on Netflix after you died. But I want to be like Loisin, not the little kid who you spent your 20s scolding. I'm selfish, but I always wanted you to be in China in case I visited as a Loisin. To make you jealous or proud, I don't know, but aren't these feelings the same? Thank you, Tina. All right, our next reader is Christine. Hi, this is a me uh, a excerpt from my memoir, tentatively titled Subtext and Volleyball. I also wanted to preface this with a small trigger warning. There will be non-graphic mentions of suicide. So if you feel the need to meet me, go ahead. Feet slip on the dusty ochre floor, which begs to be freshly waxed. Bodies collide into each other, elbows and knees implanting themselves into soft flesh. Bleachers, net pulls, and innocent line judges are nothing but ludicrous hurdles. 
bruises become celebratory medals. Knee braces, ankle wraps, finger splints, and doctor's warnings are merely inconvenient suggestions, so we slip off our gauzes and hide them within the folds of our bags, secrets that disintegrate underneath our tongues. The coaches know nothing. We are secret KT tape mummies, double agents, aching students by day, and volleyball dynamos by afternoon. Volleyball is a game of sacrifice. We immolate all our survival instincts, dolphin diving into the wall or standing still, waiting to get a face full of ball traveling 50 miles per hour. In volleyball, there's only one rule, save every ball. I met Jamie through volleyball. She was lankly and gangly, a remarkable 5'9 at 13 years old. She couldn't play defense. And at 5'4, I couldn't play offense. We were two pieces of the same puzzle. I passed, she hit, and we embraced on the court. Finding friends at a young age is hard, establishing boundaries is difficult, and soon enough, they become your entire world. In a way, Jamie consumed me. Alleviating her happiness became my sworn duty. She was convinced that I could save her, and as a natural consequence, so was I. But the inescapable reality of our friendship was that I was clouded by her negative energy. I was suffocating, and I craved rest, even if it were just for a moment. And because empathy is exhaustible and freedom is addicting, I made a new truth. My guilty truth was that I could no longer bear being nothing but emotional anger. So I lied. I told her that my phone was being taken away and I couldn't text her and I reiterated the same untruth to her mother and I made just one big lie. I didn't talk to her for weeks and halfway through the season, she left. I moved on without a moment of hesitation. I found a new partner and we moved like Hogwarts on the court. A year later, Jamie died by suicide. I figured that it was my lie that killed her. Maybe if I had just stayed friends with her, I could have saved her. After her funeral, my parents drove me to her house. Foreclosure. Her mother hugged me, and for a moment, I was frozen with fear. This was a murder confession. How do I tell a mother that I killed her daughter? When I finally told her, she was spilling out like vomit, she laughed. It isn't your fault, baby, she told me, holding my hands in hers. You couldn't have saved her. No one could have. I left club volleyball in the past. Volleyball was just a reminder of my criminality. Instead, I dreamed of Jamie. Sometimes I dreamed that I was playing volleyball, my hands painted red with her blood, staining the ball with my guilt. But sometimes I dreamed of her forgiveness. High school volleyball is different. The coaches push you off the court when they see a limp forming. They squint suspiciously when you lie about how badly your knee hurts. They tell you that some balls aren't worth the injuries you will sustain. Under the one rule, there's a subtext. You can't save every ball. It's okay to save yourself first. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Next is Stella Lynn. Um, hi, today I'll be reading an excerpt of a piece addressed to my father. Dear dad, Sometimes you act like a child. You like race cars, comics, and action movies. You like, you ask the dog if she can do push-ups. You giggle as you pop popcorn in her heavy cast iron pan. You walk with your hands in your pockets as if you're still hiding dirt, stones, or other captured mischief. But you don't like to be seen as a kid. So I'll tell you something you'd want to hear. You're more American than I am. Any insult that is thrown at America, you take it personally, as if you are American. You idolized America's democracy, freedom, meat, and guns. I wonder how it must have felt then. That night, we had a rare family dinner in Sacramento. Having finished, we walked out of the restaurant to a man in the street. It was dark, windy, and dry. The man's face was hidden in the dark. This isn't China, the man said. I thought I must have heard him wrong. Around us, the passersby continued conversations and strolled to their destinations. This ain't China, this is America, he said, this time unmistakably loud. The man faced us in the middle of the street, and I wondered if there was something sinister behind his back. You and mom herded everyone towards the car. You got in the driver's seat and locked the doors. I sat in the back seat watching your face in the rear room mirror. Maybe it was too dark to see, but I don't remember what you looked like at that moment. Perhaps you kept a tight, you kept a tight smile because my sister and I were there. But I think that if you had been alone, he would have embodied one of those action movie men, gone back out and punched the man. Sometimes I imagine you pummeling him in the face, screaming, I hate China just as much as you do. I imagine the blood running down your hand, red stripes against your pale knuckles. 
there's something I must confess. From time to time, I'm so ungrateful that I think in my American privilege that it might be nicer to live in China. A few years ago, I asked if you would have stayed in China if you could choose again. Of course, you said no. But wait, I wanted to say maybe you should reconsider because I couldn't let go of those relatives I had met briefly in China when I was young. I didn't even know their names and I could barely manage to address them properly. But in the years I spent back in the US, listening to classmates talk about weekends with cousins and Christmases with grandparents, I realized I was missing the awkward interrogations at family dinners, the heirlooms, the holidays. But then your parents died, first your mother, then your father. When the news came, you stood in the hallway crying while I could only stand there. Seeing my apathy for the people you loved, did you regret coming to America then? Thank you. Thank you, Stella. Our next piece is from someone whose location I did not mention earlier. Uh, while he is from New Jersey, during this workshop, he has been in Las Vegas and Ohio. Here is Zach. Hello, um, I'm going to be reading a object essay I wrote about my journal and I hope you guys enjoy it. My journal was born two, year, two years ago amongst the towering buildings and soft clam chatter of Boston. My family visited the city after my brother got into the Harvard Science Research Conference, jubilant with joy. It was here where I read Vine Holliday's Stillness is a Key and found my affinity for journaling. Friendship may be a better term to describe my relationship with my journal. I began my friendship in Boston, but my journal never left my side. Carried to starry sky log cabin retreats, snowy winter nights, and sunrise mornings, the lined paper of my journal became the medium through which I experienced life. As each memory became a page and each dream became a prayer, my journal never questioned me. My journal never doubted me, never told me I was not enough never told me I couldn't do anything I set my mind to. My journal's silent companionship was a reflective pool in which I built my friendship with myself. I can recall a poem I wrote while I was sick over New Year's in the sloping mountains of the Poconos. Head throbbing, I wrote the following in my journal. The days pass on with each silent moon giving way to tangerine mornings. And as I lie in bed and dream and dream and dream, the, the colors of the world are alive within. As time devoids of meaning, the crystal chandelier shines bright as a, as a thousand stars, and I dream on forever. I can recall the aspirations etched in that journal, etched in my life. I wrote down my goals for the track season, glazing off the knowledge of hundreds of YouTube videos, books such as Daniel's Running Formula, and wisdom of my coaches and friends. I constructed a training plan for, for in my journal for each week. Rehabbing my winter injuries, I was to start at 20 miles a week in February, hit 30 miles a week by March, and 40 by April. I can do anything I set my mind to, I wrote in May. I love you, you are enough. June, the sunny track gleams with radiance, the sound of scratching spikes on track, a story already written between print and lines. The story would come true. I would break the school record in Andrew meters and place 15th in the state. My journal was there for me when I needed it the most. During the pandemic, as my world shrank to the confines of my home in the supermarket, my journal never left me. My journal kept me sane. It allowed me to plan each day and reflect on, my, on the thoughts in my head. It was lonely. It was depressing. The world became sullen and the sun's flavor dimmed to candlelight. But when you know yourself, you can never truly be alone. My journal became my portal to myself, the portal to my essence. A first kiss, a song about heartbreak, an awakening, gratitude. Fossilized insects in amber, ice frozen bodies. My journal is a story of my life forever preserved in time. It's guided me through dark tunnels, opened my eyes to the stillness of a candescent flower, the joy of friends and family, and sow the seeds of poems to blossom. Wherever I am, I know that I'll carry a piece of my soul with me, laced together on paper with words, forever accompanied. Thank you, Zach. Oh, we are now joined by the Associate Director of the Summer Workshop, my cat, Alfie. <laughs> uh, we learned recently that, that Alfie here is older than some of the participants in the summer workshop. Now you know too. Our next reader is Riley. Uh, yeah, this is an excerpt from my direct address. Um, okay. 
To the girl utterly convinced everybody hates you, life isn't middle school. You won't always be so alone and alone won't always feel so lonely. But none of that means anything to you because things will get better doesn't mean things don't suck now. There are so many things you'll wish you never said, but so many more you'll wish you had. My first piece of advice, don't be so afraid of getting in trouble. Ask to move seats and work alone. When the girl seated beside you in Latin class gives you a bad feeling, the one with the forgettable face who acts way too friendly, trust it. You'll end up doing at least all the work for every assignment. You only took this class to spite your father and will drop it junior year when it's no longer mandatory. Sit down with a group at lunch. Don't wait to be invited. If the girl from Latin class invites you to sit down with her, be wary. You'll love the company, but she'll dominate the conversation. You're lonely. You tried to no avail to impress someone who made your contact name weird girl in her phone. You see sitting alone is the most embarrassing thing to happen. To be honest, you're a bit desperate. She knows, she can smell it. Use a stall during the swim unit to change or say you're on your period. The PE teacher won't track and you hate your body. The girl from Latin class will borrow a swimsuit. Don't give her one you like, she will accidentally bleach it. The same way she will offer to hold up a towel for you and accidentally drop it. Nobody but her will remember how your ribs show and how pointy your spine is and how pale you are under your clothes. She won't let you forget how small your chest is whenever you change. You wish she wouldn't look at all. If you did the same, you'd see the tissues padding her bra. Pay attention in class. Ignore the girl in Latin as she tells you she's becoming wicked. You don't understand the test material and she will cut a lock of your hair. She won't ask permission but tells you instead it's for a spell for protection. You don't say anything. You have thick hair. Your mother won't notice. You need friends and you think back to what she told you the day prior that they would always choose her. So you let her take that lock of hair until she tells you it's for a death spell. You don't believe in magic but there's something about being 13 and knowing someone wants you dead. Thank you, Riley. Whew. All right. Next is Fiona. Hi. Um, let me know if you guys can hear me okay. Um, so I'm going to read a rather short piece that we actually did. I wrote it this morning because um, we were doing some exercises with um, I Remember by I Forget Who. But um, so it's just a series of like, I remember, I remember, I remember. And yeah, I'm just gonna read it. It's called First Impressions of the World. I remember the first time I saw my new bedroom. I remember sticking plastic stars and moons and paper planets to the ceiling. I remember thinking this would remind me of home. I remember longing for pink bed sheets because my friend made fun of my blue ones that had cars on them. I remember the color of my first bedroom, plasticky red, like a toy fire truck. I remember my dad singing me a song about a blackbird to help me sleep. I remember him falling asleep before he could finish. I remember waking him up and laughing. I remember the lyrics, take these broken wings and learn to fly. I remember my mom and her guitar. I remember how she mumbled lyrics she couldn't remember and she let her voice dissipate into breathing when there was a high note. I remember how her, how her words stuck together, how they clung to her teeth when she tried to explain to me how death is permanent. I remember learning in chemistry that matter can't be fully destroyed. I remember thinking that was bullshit because I knew people that mattered and they were gone. I remember sitting on our kitchen counter and eating blueberries and whipped cream. I remember scooping the whipped cream off. I don't remember when I started hating blueberries. I remember the cherry blossom trees in the park where I had my fourth birthday party. I remember the rubber swings and the bird droppings on dark green benches. I remember telling my little brother it was white chocolate. I remember he ate it, and I remember he didn't care that it wasn't white chocolate. I remember when my grandfather stopped coming to my birthday parties. I remember skinning my knee when I fell off my bike, and I remember the taste of the lemon ice pot my mom brought me afterwards. It was raining, so it tasted slightly waterlogged. I remember thinking about how good the lemon ice pot felt pressed to a skinned knee. I remember it dripping down and pooling at my ankle, and I remember it sticking to the inside of my favorite pair of socks. I don't remember when I stopped wearing socks, but I remember how sand felt under my heels. And I remember crying on the sidewalk because my feet were bleeding. I remember tears sizzling on asphalt. I remember crying during my first kiss because he was stepping on my toes. And I remember thinking I did a good job convincing him my tears were just rain. 
I remember crying over a pair of jeans that didn't fit. I remember screaming and throwing things and I remember hating the way anger felt and the way jealousy burnt a hole in my stomach. I don't remember how long it's been since I've yelled. I remember feeling overwhelmed on the subway between sweat and people breathing and people rushing to be somewhere. I remember wondering how to make space for myself in a world where everyone always had somewhere to be. Thank you. All right, Fiona. Cheers to reading something you wrote today. Wow. All right. Our next reader is Sydney M. Hi, this is an excerpt from my essay titled Battle with the Paddle. I spent more than a decade of my life flying. I would ready myself in my uniform, place my gear on the ground, and dive off the block, soar, and then brace myself for impact. My earliest memories regarding competitive swimming are fragmented. My maroon parka scraping against my ankles, the pain throbbing in my chest from holding my breath for 25 meters, my swim cap tugging at my tucked in hair. For 11 years of my life, I was a swimmer. As I progressed in the hierarchy of the team, based on speed and age, I was granted permission to use more advanced swim equipment, buoys, flippers, kickboards, and eventually paddles. Ever since I was a child, I had small hands, a seemingly irrelevant detail, unless you're a swimmer. Hands define the swimmer's speed, and speed defines the swimmer's value. When racing, you must pull as much water back and fling it out as your arm extends to meet the surface. This allows more distance between you and where you started from. Swimmers are trained to master the art of pulling. The first step is to use swim paddles. My paddles were gray and yellow, and I was humiliated by that. Because I was the only member in the group with a size small, my paddles were unique in that color and stuck out, a painful reminder of my limitation. If I'm honest, I rather abused my paddles, shoving them to the depths of my swim bag, tugging them against the ragged edges of the rest of my gear, chucking them from afar to the edge of the pool. Each time coach said, paddles out, I would sigh and whine and lament. Paddles out meant swimming without kicking. We had to solely rely on the strength of our arms to propel us through the water, and we swam hundreds of meters like that. I saw it as half swimming, a betrayal to freestyle in its truest form. Pulling and kicking were meant to be used in conjunction. Trying to master one without the other felt like wearing an empty locket. Pointless. The first few times I used my paddles, I refused to adjust my swimming to them. My paddle crashed with my every stroke and the impact of unnerving plastic against the water caused me to slow. When I finally emerged at the end of each paddle set, I could sense the silent stares behind the fogged goggles of my teammates. In contrast, when I pulled off my paddles, I sped by everyone in my lane, feeling light and new. My paddles were inhibiting my ability to swim. For this reason, I loathed my paddles. I would lie to coach and say that I forgot my paddles at home so I could do the set with my bare hands. The strategy didn't last. Coach began to have sets of paddles available to all those who had left them at home, even size small paddles. So I looked for other ways to inflict damage on my paddles. I bent, tugged, undid, even bit them. One time I had the idea of rolling them around in the dirt track by the pool. But even if my paddles got dirty, they didn't last like that for long. Upon using them, they would emerge from the spool, from the pool spotless. No matter how much I tried to, my paddles refused to allow me to make my mark on them. Thank you, Sydney. All right, next is Grace. Hello, everyone. I'm reading an excerpt of my Safe Kids essay. Um, and I'm just going to start in the middle. And then I saw her, the great blue heron living on the property. I'd never been so close to such a tall, magnificent bird. She swooped down from the, her large stick nest at the top of the tallest pine and brushed to the surface of the water with her talons. She circled around the pond and gracefully emerged into the water, like a smooth pebble thrown at the precision to skip slowly across the pond before sinking into the algae and lily pads. 
I'd never envied a bird quite as much as her. I envied how weightless she looked while flying because of her hollow bones, how each wing spread to create feet of shade, and how swiftly she could spear carp and bluegill with her bill. A perfect agile kill, spitting out the skulls of fish on the bank. I remember how she looked at me. Something in her brown eyes was infectious, something wild and tame. I wanted to understand her more than I wanted to be her. I knew that becoming her would be to empty out everything that made me human, replacing it with trout scales, frail spines, and fish oil. I visited her every day. I sat at the edge of the wooden dock, swinging my legs back and forth, watching her. I craved the wildness, the tameness, and the comfort in, in her eyes and movements. I like to think she saved me from something. She noticed me. She knew I, I would pick up the skulls she left behind. Even if the bones were not offerings, the evenings I spent on the dock living with her made me feel like I belonged somewhere. I had to make myself a home to survive. As a young parentless child, I had no other choice. I like to think she knew how my knees popped when I swung them, how I squinted while inspecting algae by swirling it around with long stick, how I made leaf rubbings with charcoal while she hunted. We became a part of each other's home until we both left. The worst part of recalling a bird song or the vibrant orange of a baby bird's beak or the small divots of tree in the tree bark is the fact that you are only remembering. You have left the woodpecker's favorite oak, the porch light you hollowed out for the robin to build her nest and the maple that smelled of syrup where the morning dove perched at dawn. You are only rem remembering the wildness while never forgetting the calmness in a heron's eye. I never feared leaving a place I called home. I feared forgetting everything the birds taught me there. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Our next reader is Haley. All right, I'm reading an, es an excerpt from one of my essays. My first love is scattered amongst my friends. It was they who intertwined their hands with mine and refused to let go. I would sit down at the lunch table, burying my head into my arms. My brow was perpetually furrowed. Mickey would chuckle and knowingly shake her head. She'd take her plastic knife in one hand and lecture me while spreading cream cheese across her bagel. Haley Bell, she'd start dramatically waving her knife at me while dropping cheese on the floor. You have got to dump his sorry ass. Queen shit is not having your standards below the ground, she exclaimed. I would laugh and wipe the fatigue from my eyes. She'd keep talking about how all men are shit, TM, and I'd realize I missed my cat greatly. I'd send a text to my sister asking for a picture of him. It was Mickey's morning sermon and pictures of my cat that helped me feel more secure. My other friend Goodman's way of comforting was different. We would all gather in his car and drive out to the countryside, hands sticking out of the windows, making waves in the wind. He always had everything he needed in his trunk. In this instance, it was fireworks. He'd hand me a lighter, flashing a crooked smile. Have a go, he'd laugh. We watched the bursts of color in the sky, huddled together like geese. I feel more connected when we're all together. On the other hand, Becca and I always went out together. She'd drive us out to an abandoned bridge off some back roads, and we'd sit on the hood. She'd ask me, so, how have you really been? And I wouldn't even know how to begin to answer that question. My silence turned over more silence, so we sat there and looked at the sky. Neither of us bothered. It was warm, and the stars were bright. Thank you. Thank you, Haley. Our next reader is Jenna. Um, hi, everyone. I will be reading an excerpt from um, Safe Kids Story. And it's the best moment. The laugh tracks from the Marinius home videos for you would mix with my family's chuckles and giggles a cacophony of noise every Sunday night. It was a tradition. We'd gather up in my grandma's living room, belly stuffed with home-cooked dinner, and find my grandma cleaning up the room. She had never learned how to <clears throat> input the channels individually, so her last resort was to switch from channel to channel. 
one click at a time. She'd skip over news, sports, infomercials, cartoons, and reality TV shows until she found the chatting AFE. When we gathered to watch, we had an assigned seating order. One couch located to the very, on the couch located very to, the, to the very left side of the TV, I would switch up against my cousins, Michael and Rachel, and my older sister, Jessica. Opposite of us were the fathers, Uncle Mike and my dad, and in the very center of the room sat the mothers, Auntie Kel, my mom, and my grandma. AFE is exactly what the title suggests. They take videos sent in from viewers and create compilations of the best moments. Some nights, the video categories were along the lines of epic training fails or crazy pool moments, and those never failed to get a reaction out of my uncle. Ooze and awe escaped his mouth, and moments later, he'd be chatting. The laughter was contagious and would overtake everyone in the room. Moments like those so often that they became one jumbled up memory at the back of my mind. They didn't reach this until tonight gathering swindle. My cousins were off to college, my sister out on dates, my uncle working graveyard shifts, and my dad choosing to stay home instead to watch his sport signal. In all of their absence, I found a new seated directly to my grandma. Gina, she'd say, spotting upon spotting me. Her Filipino accent made her pronounce the J as a heavy G sound. Her other times, she kept silent and still. My grandma had dementia. I had known back then that it was important to cherish the moment she remembered me. But being a young child, still in the single digits, I took it for granted. Without the rest of my family, without the contagion after, everything became boring. AFB was reduced to our go-to show for background noise and the laugh, the laugh track filling the hollowness left behind. I stopped bothering to watch and it seems like my grandma had forgotten how to laugh. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. All right, we have five readers left. And what I am amazed at is that means we have had, we've gotten through uh, 18, I believe. And in such short excerpts, first of all, everybody is following the rules about time very well. And also in these short excerpts, we're getting so much, which means, you're all doing something right, to say the least. Uh, our next reader is Jeho. Hi, I'm. Uh, my name is Jeho So. I'm from Scarsdale, New York, and today I'm going to be reading an excerpt from my object essay, which is about my camera. I love using my camera to capture reality because by tweaking its controls and the mise en scène of its view just right it reveals my inner vision. There are many variables at my disposal, lighting, angle, zoom, motion, timing, and the adjustment of each variable accentuates different aspects of my subject. Sometimes it leads to a blurry or overexposed image of the image. Sometimes it leads to an image that's just a literal representation of what I'm looking at. But every so often, it results in a depiction that reveals this ideal representation of the world that I see. In the pursuit of a sublime nocturnal scene, I twist my camera's dials and buttons for long exposure photography, slowing the shutter speed in order for the lens to capture more light. If the sun is shining bright during the day, this results in a washed out blur. But if the scene is dark, save for a few striking sources of light, the magic happens. Those are the moments I wait for. When the bluish gray sky begins to dim and the street is full of swarms of buzzing cars, I pull my camera off of my neck. I hold it by its rubbery grip as I thread its solid bulk into the tripod. I slowly extend its lens as my eye touches the viewfinder and I look through. The cars and buses and trucks speed by, oblivious to my presence as they rush to their destinations. When the sun finally sinks below the horizon line, 
The cars morph into angry fireflies, their moving lights reflected in the monolithic glass windows of silent buildings. The stream of carts emit their blazing lights, and I clutch my camera tight, squeezing its shutter button. I take my camera home to look over the results of my night's work. The real is merged with the surreal. The cars have been replaced by flickering and fading trails of neon whites, yellows, and reds. They light up the night, forming webs of radiant distortion juxtaposed against the shadowy surroundings. In the midst of the suburban jungle, I've captured a parade of spirits, the northern lights, and a fireworks show. This is the reality I see that others pass by. It is brilliant. Thank you, Jeho, our resident voice actor. All right, next is Anya. Hi, um, I'll be reading a piece from my first workshop. It's called Bitches Meditating on Boys Town. Um, before I start, there's a content warning for descriptions of anti-Black, anti-queer, and anti-trans violence and police brutality. Um, you can just mute the audio while I'm reading. All right. We remember the young queen on the red line to Belmont. She's serving us grocery bag finery in black mesh cropped and the painted nails are a dead giveaway that would have gotten us killed anywhere else. With the matched gaze between us, a mutual machismo in the closet, she speaks up. The queen scoffs at us, not unkindly. Y'all really think drag queens are gonna start a march on time? She's right. The pig pen remembers that pride is a riot no matter where or when. Passed down from our kin is an oral history that remembers the same surveillance as the pigs in Greenwich, the same policing that borders their bodies, except this time the cop cars have rainbow decals. Twelve is never going to forget our withering gaze that could burn a cop car alive with the same fire of the Molotov cocktail Sylvia Rivera threw 52 years ago. There are no cops at Pride, we say, not on the East Coast and certainly not here, and there are definitely no cops at an abolition drag march. Because, see, we'll read you bitches for filth and let you roll around in it after, because we like our queers out of uniform. The asphalt remembers a spit of fags mixed with menthol and Chinese takeout. You can tell you're in Boys Town because the ashtrays are filled with menthols instead of reds. In the words of Big and Rich, save a horse. There are no cowboy killers in Boys Town. Lindsay the heartthrob remembers to us her getting jumped in Boys Town. She never threw the first punch, but ended up in that questioning room the same as the others. For the timeline where Lindsay is alive and telling us this story, there are infinite timelines where the gay cop pulled out his gun before he reached for the handcuffs. The cops remember the chance. It goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, fuck twelve. We made sure they wouldn't forget the faces of our brothers, sisters, and siblings who still march with us, but their feet don't touch the Boys Town asphalt. This is clockwork orange for the pig pen, 1984 for Big Brother. The category is Animal Farm, and these bitches are about to get clocked. Say it with me now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven dead queers. The gay bars remember fakes, poppers, and white gays raising their drinks to us from shaded patio brunch and bottomless 1 p.m. mimosas. Fuck your brunch, we say. Skip your supper. I remember the old queen in the march line next to me, wrinkled hands on his hips and earlobes drooping under the weight of gold hoops. She stayed long after I left. A vigil candle remembers the first time it burns. You're supposed to let the candle burn one hour for every inch of wax diameter, one hour of silence for every single queen not walking with us today. A candle extinguished too early remembers the unburnt wax no matter how many times you try to relight it. My body does not forget the scars you laid upon me of the empty stomachs, the cop cars, and the small town white supremacy. Ball walking is a life or a death where I walk for my life to not get clocked. Thank you. Thank you, Anya. Our next reader is Nina. Okay, I'm gonna read my Safe Kids story essay starting from like the middle or read an excerpt from it. So I can say without a doubt that my reaction to this incident was largely the result of growing up black in a society where black pain is a highly sought out commodity that propels the structures and institutions that feed off our suffering and demand our complacency. As a result, we are taught to submit to this oppressive hierarchy 
smiling just to live another day. If I were to try to put the Black American experience into words, I'd barely scratch the surface of the beauty and pain found in the hearts of those who refuse to be nameless. But I start by saying this, to be Black in America is to have your self-worth defined by the barriers you overcome, while the people who cheer for you hold them in place. It's to be told by a stranger that you'll write good college essays because you're a low-income minority. It's to forcibly smile when the Fairmount liberal with the Biden 2020 sticker stuck on her travel mug like a badge of honor begins the class discussion with, from the Black perspective. To be Black in America is to constantly be in search of a place in a world that under legislation that supports those who want to capitalize off our destruction. It's to watch my neighborhood crumble before me so that I will never know what my grandmother's house looked like. It's to pass real estate signs on new developments, detailing how beautiful the neighborhood will be once they finish construction, once you are gone. It's to live without the glue to keep the broken pieces of yourself together because black doesn't crack like the pavement on the streets I once used to call my own. To be black in America is to be free from chains but shackled to a criminal justice system that believes death is a suitable punishment for the possession of a $5 foot long. To be black is to laugh, to be black in America is to laugh with the cashier as you insist you need that plastic bag for your chewing gum. It's to peer into the window of a pulled over car and hope whoever's in the driver's seat lives to see another day. Thank you, Nina. Two readers left. Our next reader is Ashley. Hi everyone, I am going to be reading my object essay. All right, here goes nothing. <laughs> As I aged like fine ramen, they became emblematic of a lifestyle. They were convenient in frugality marketed in vibrant packs. Busha Busha graced fourth grade snack period as an instant popularity booster by 520% and the warmth radiating from the tonkatsu cup noodles kept me company on raining middle school bus rides home at 7.30 p.m. In freshman year, they were microwaved and cooled in the dorm until it no longer burned on my tongue, then gulped down all in the five minutes it took for me to walk up to the auditorium for weekly announcements, with perfect timing to discard the disposable bowl in the trash can right outside. My school did not trust us with hot water kettles, or perhaps they didn't want kids like me to overdose on sodium. Though ramen could be a solitary activity, its flavors were only enhanced upon another ingredient, another companion, and another mythology. Ramen became a basis for memories. My best friend and I explored Asia with a single lane at the store. Japanese yakisoba, Korean shin ramen, Chinese kang shifu, indomie, and pho. We lived off our widest dreams inside our bowls, distanced from what we couldn't control in our own lives. With cheese, milk, egg, bacon, or spring onions, we let our imagination fill what standard instructions could not. Like any other food, there was times where I had enough. Where my favorite ramen tasted slimy and rubbery between lips stained with tears. Artificiality could no longer mask the craving for something real, something whole. Every time I tear into a package, fill hot water in my bowl, and devour the seasoned noodles with metal chopsticks, I'm reminded of the fact that ramen is, is and always will be temporary. They expire, they stale, their carbol sauce turns into the color of pesto. I will never be able to hold on to them forever like people do to their favorite sweatshirts or Doc Martens, movie tickets of their first date or signed copy of their favorite novel. Instead of keeping memories, I stack them. Every bite becomes another piece of the story in a larger narrative, every package a point on the scattergram of my life. While I'm grateful that ramen no longer needs to be a necessity, I know it will always remain as one. On rainy days, on days where I don't know what to make, on days where cooking is just overrated, when steam rises from the spittle, spout of a kettle or the piercing of a pot lid and whimsical crimps unfurl itself in its bath, I'll bring out a porcelain bowl and be reminded of childhood days where love was as abundant as laughter and spinach and egg ramen that started it all. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley ramen expert, ramen resident, ramen scholar. All right, ramen influencer, that's a good one. We just got that in the Zoom chat. All right, our very last reader for this evening is the one and only Kevin. Okay, hi, I'm Kevin. Um, apologies for not having a red shirt. It's across the country right now. 
Um, but I'm going to be reading um, an abridged version of my Safe Kids essay titled Intimate Dangers of a Practice Room. Practice rooms are supposed to be a musician's safe haven. With canvas limitations, a soundproofing walls, they are reality's anomaly, conforming melody and harmony into astute inner dialogue. But at that moment, clarity became cacophony, an auditory petrification bolstered upon fear of failure. It's ironic how no amount of self-preparation or reassurance can quell pre-audition arthritis or prevent adrenaline spiked droplets from encapsulating my hands in glove-like grime. It's almost like prison. Every one of us assigned a number awaiting a trial that will define your musical capability. As a pianist, I've learned to become an expert multitasker. Not only do I have to coordinate all four limbs, but also read up to four lines simultaneously, all the while painstakingly controlling every motif, dynamic contrast, rhythmic dissonance, and harmonic counterpoint. What that means is that sometimes to play the piano beautifully means to endure suffocation. This forced attention coupled with the audition devitalization turns a practice room claustrophobic. These are the thoughts that cloud me as my timer towards showtime shifts from hours to minutes. Because in a room with nothing but echoes and a piano, I can't help but hammer away at the keys, mutating lyricism into shame. Nevertheless, even with the forsaken security of the practice room, I barricade myself in. As the second I leave, it would mean absorbing the frigid gazes of other auditioners and acknowledging their seeming superiority. And to the teachers and friends and family that commend my hard work, stop. Because this isn't a celebration of struggle and success, but rather the crossroads between an abyss and a stage. Understand that musicians are trained to fail, that the basis of musical success is sharing a craft. Lessons and teachers are for inspiration, practicing is your notebook, and performance is your audience. But without the opportunity to perform, musicians drown. Days of injuries, technical frustration, and economic stress become meaningless endurances, and that's the stake of an audition. But as with any other seemingly insurmountable obstruction, there's always a solution. For me, that meant letting someone in. With her presence, the practice room no longer rang, and so I played, a figure who could be a reverse Pandora's box and replace numbness with emotion. So as I approached the room of judgment, shivers still plagued me and intimidation from those before me triumphed, but I exuded certainty. Pressures of validation didn't disappear, but merely took a seat behind confidence. As I walked onto center stage, I stifled myself and projected myself back in the practice room. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you, everybody. We did it. This might be a record for, I don't know what exactly what it's a record for, but we got through all of these readers. Everybody was brilliant. I don't know what else to say. We're just, we're so grateful. Um, I will just, let everybody else's words speak for, for the Summer Workshop community. I'm grateful to all of the readers. I'm grateful to everybody who supported these readers tonight, who helped get them here, including maybe some friends and some family and some chosen family who might be watching on YouTube either right now or later on, since this is archived forever. Um, summer Workshop folks, I will see you all tomorrow for our final words and everybody else. I hope you will join us virtually or in person at the writer's house as soon as you can again. And thank you one more time for being here tonight. <laughs>